Greetings of Friday, Christian, Christian Green, and President Germany resigned. Hold out pressure was there. And of all possible people, we are going to end up with a Germany run by two former East Germans. Uh, it's the first time such a thing happens. As you know, that Angela Merkel is the daughter of a Protestant pastor in East Germany, and the designated new president of Germany is Pastor Joachim Gauck, the founder of the Gauck Authority, which is the institution dealing with precisely the issues that we are going to discuss here today. So that's not something that today, for instance, I interrupted a uh, series of lectures for my students in Maryland, that usually is called Rising for Communists, that we are not going to discuss the NEP. Today we are going to discuss post-communist justice. Okay, because this is a front page New York Times. So if New York Times can discuss it front page, we can do the same thing. And uh, I totally agree. Some of you may have read the other day's New York Times book review. On page two, there is a very interesting letter addressed by Timothy Snyder to Frank Uh If you haven't read it yet, it's worth being read. On that occasion, Tim Snyder, you know, Fukuyama reviewed for the New York Times book review the book of conversations between Tony Judd and and Tim Snyder. So uh, Fukuyama said at the end, I teach these issues at Stanford. I teach to a generation that was not even alive at the moment the Berlin Wall came down. Uh, and for them, all these isms don't mean anything. And Tim said, I don't know about your students. For my students, they mean a lot. And if they want to understand what's going to happen in the 21st century, you'd better teach them to okay, care about these issues. So since we care about these issues, and since you know we are still we have students here who care about, even if they were not, you know, I was not born in Napoleon Bonaparte, I was an important person, and I'm enormously interested in Napoleon Bonaparte. I mean, why should I be or Alexander the Great or whatever? Uh, so uh, I'm very interested in Jugashvili, and uh, you know why not? I mean, uh, or in Schickel Gruber, and uh, why not? I mean, the original names of uh, the worst human beings of the 20th century, Stalin. Okay. So, uh, this being said, Marius, uh, so you will speak for about what, 10 minutes? Yeah. Okay, great. Marius, Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks a lot for being here today. Is this one? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the other one? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> yeah. First, I think I should play the first two, two, two slides about the Institute's uh, main objectives and uh, operations. And this is why I'm going to, to, to tell you the short story behind the East German Peace of the in Europe. And then I I'll sh shall pass on to getting uh, uh, you familiarized with the content of the, the two, two volumes that uh, have appeared on here now. Of uh, this economies in Europe, with a little bit of a focus on uh, the current issue of how it does the intellectuals and the economies. Um, from 2006 to 2009, the Institute for the Investigation of Communist Crimes, the memory of the main website, uh, under a slightly different name at the time, I must say, has published a tier book only for the Romanian readers. And following this, the Institute has marked its fifth anniversary is changing the scholarly leadership by launching the international series of the journal under a new title in form. This is History of Communism in Europe. This periodical provides an uh, interdisciplinary forum for explorations in the multifaceted history of the Communist regimes in Romania, Eastern Europe, and elsewhere. No. HCE aims to attract Romanian and international scholars interested in the history and the memory of the far left ideologies which uh, have proceeded, coincided with, and followed in the world of the Cold War. The editors encourage original contributions regarding the large, largely un unknown and understudied aspects of the communist class in Europe. All articles are blind refereed except when invited. HCE promotes <laughs> um, original scholarship that demonstrates an awareness of the methodolog methodological problems raised by the study of tot totalitarianism. A special feature of the journal is uh, its book review section, and the contributor of a study article or the review the article receives a copy of the journal issue. The authors may purchase additional copies of, of, of this. Um, now, the first issue was dedicated to the politics of memory in the communist Europe. 
uh, it tackled theoretical aspects of the administration of the past and the memory which have appeared during the developing uh, of a unitary and continuous apprehension over the European history in the 20th century. The first issue of uh, HCE contained 18 articles covering three different sections of the vast in, in the politics of mem memory. The museographic discourse dedicated to the history and the memory of communism, the artistic representations uh, of the memory of communism, and politics of memory in various countries uh, of the post communist era. The authors which have uh, contributed for the first issue belong to nine different countries. And I should mention Romania, Albania, Estonia, Germany, Croatia, the United States, Bulgaria, Macedonia, and Switzerland. Now, I'll just turn to, to the reason why I'm here, at least why I'm here today, the second issue of uh, HCE. And this is uh, the front cover. Uh, in 2011, the subject matter of the second issue of HCE was uh, Avatars of Intellectuals and Economies. And the main idea of uh, the new issue is that the relationship between the intellectuals and the party state is of vital importance to researchers willing to grasp the fate of those communities of expert knowledge, uh, of artists, of uh, cultural people during Carnes. This issue contains original contributions uh, mostly based on uh, recently uh, desecuritized documents or which have only been made available to historians in the past few years. The second issue of the journal is divided into four uh, thematic sections, as you can see right there, and uh, a section uh, dedicated to reviews. I believe some additional things must be said to this brief introduction. In Eastern Europe, succeeding generations of intellectuals have been at the forefront of first creating and then demolishing the uh, the communist regime, and that is because communism was ultimately uh, based on ideas, a democracy, like uh, Cesar Milos would say, and uh, the abandonment of uh, these ideas by intellectuals uh, turned dissidents was a critical factor in the demise of the communist regimes. As uh, Daniel Shiro emphasizes, communism died more from uh, ideological exhaustion and uh, utter more rather than from its economic malaise or the pressure of organized uh, opposition movements. Uh, the dissident intellectuals, powerless uh, as they seem to be, uh, delivered the decisive uh, blow when they uh, denounced the regime's underlying ideology as ritualized lies uh, out of touch with reality. Uh, and uh, in this regard, we uh, can see what's not happened. When intellectuals in Eastern Europe adopted the role of dissidents, they also fundamentally revised the political role that intellectuals had played since their first appearance as a corporate group in the, in the age of the French Revolution. Uh, Alexis uh, de Tocqueville noted that the men of letters who had taken uh, the political lead uh, during the, the last phase of the ancien regime uh, tended to indulge in abstract theories and generalizations and to be quite out of uh, touch with pra uh, practical politics. Ever since, the intellectual mood dramatically reaffirmed by the communist revolution of, of uh, 1917 uh, had been Prozality's moral mission and cultural crusade, that is, to make the world safe for abstract reason. And in this light, when Eastern European intellectuals renounced utopia, uh, they also performed an extraordinary act of self-denial. In Michael Waltz's terms, Eastern European intellectuals abandoned the role of the stereotypical leftist critic who cuts himself off from his society to discover truth and the universal values. Instead, they adopted the role of the national popular critic who remains drowning in, in uh, his society. This uh, sort of uh, conversion uh, prepared the way to the heroic comeback of the intellectuals after 1989. After 1989. Now, I'm, I must reemphasize uh, that the main premise of this volume is that the collapse of communism in Europe would not have been possible without the moral and ideological exhaustion of this uh, uh, so-called idiocratic patrol. Sorry autocracies in Martin Mayer's own words. And uh, the authors keep trace of the evolution of the relationship between various categories of intellectuals and the engagement, disillusion, and all descent towards the communist experiment. On the one hand, there, was, there were cases of disappointment or direct opposition to, uh, in regard to this absolutism of uh, the social utopia of Bolshevism. 
uh, these have become the main critical intellectuals at the core of the civil society's res resurrection in uh, Eastern Europe. On the other hand, there were cases, maybe more than in the first category, uh, in which the intellectuals have kept their faith in communism, uh, this truly form of modern ra radicalism of the 20th century. Or else, cases in which they no, yeah, that's the end of the presentation. Oh, or else cases in which they were in tune up until 1989 or 1991 as members of nomenclatura, regimes experts, or just local agents of the uh, socialist nation. The second category of intellectuals has been more often than uh, not behind post communist uh, uh, phantasm of uh, salvation uh, that managed to disrupt the young democracies in the region. The main goal of the current issue of the history of communism in Europe was to bring in new information and to offer some answers to the many questions and dilemmas involved uh, in, the, in the intellectuals' wave, uh, wavy tra trajectories uh, within the Soviet kind of communist uh, civilization. In the end, I'd like to address that uh, the issue for 2012 of uh, history of communism in Europe tackles uh, the topic of the communist nationalism and state building in post war Europe. And you may also find at the end of the current issue um, consistent call for contribution to this uh, third uh, volume, which is to, to appear by the end of this year. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for this wonderful presentation and thanks for mentioning the topics of salvation. Uh, I remember there's a short chapter there with the title Miss Bakers and Lily Breakers. So this is exactly what intellectuals have been doing. I mean, they were myth makers in the first stage and myth breakers in the second stage, and sometimes they were simultaneously myth makers and myth breakers, like in the former Yugoslavia. Uh, Bogdan came to. I didn't introduce him. I apologize for that. Bogdan Christian Jakob is there. He's the secretary of the scientific council, and he's himself a critical intellectual, and uh, who defended his PhD dissertation last year at uh, CEU on the production of knowledge in communist Romania, the focus on history. Uh, it's a very interesting dissertation. And today you borrowed from me, so please don't forget it, Andrew Wachtel's book, which is basically mis whatever, Nation Makers, Nation Breakers. And it's about intellectuals and their role in the uh, disintegration of the Soviet. <coughs> now, uh, again, where we go, what is the, so we go, who is going to comment on that? Yes, Michael David Fox. Thank you. My brief is to also comment on this issue about intellectuals and communism. And I have been invited here not so much as a historian of Romania. So if I butcher some of the Romanian names, fortunately we have many experts here to correct me, but as someone interested in the question <laughs> of intellectuals and communism. And <clears throat> It's interesting that Vladimir Tismanyanu has uh, <laughs> talked about the issue of morality, history, and um, reckoning with the past. And I think that's a very important component. And we see it done on a very high level in the German field. In the history of communism, it has often worked in several ways. There's a fine line between trying to include the moral element and politicizing scholarship. And in particular, the topic of intellectuals. And the word intellectuals has been a loaded term since the Dreyfus affair, if not earlier. And the word intelligentsia, at least in Russia, since the 1860s has been subject of debate. And especially when you get intellectuals talking about other intellectuals, one sees the phenomenon of the term acquiring a sort of normative cast in that intellectuals are supposed to either be one way to speak truth to power or to be critical or that all intellectuals are alienated or utopian by disposition and so on. And Marcy Shore in her book Caviar and Ashes, which I know Vladimir likes, an interwar, history of interwar Polish intellectuals and, and Marxism and communism, spoke about the tendency in her introduction to that book, the tendency to martyrology and demonology and the two tend to go together. So therefore, it's quite a pleasure to see the range of rubrics, rubrics um, in which this issue discusses intellectuals and communism, mainly in Romania, but also in other European countries. And 
you've seen the contents. You have discussions of Western intellectuals looking at communism. You have discussions of artists and cultural figures, both official and unofficial. You have discussions of experts, academics, scholars, uh, including party scholars as a type of intellectual. And you have discussions of dissidents and nonconformists. So in other words, the reductionist urge to talk about all intellectuals as under a single rubric has not only been resisted, we see reflected here intellectuals as occupying the entire spectrum of relations with the communist regime, both among its most important constructors and its most important critics. Um, now, it's worth asking why intellectuals played this outsized role in communism. And there are many ways of answering the question. If, in social terms, the intelligentsia in the early phases of communist regimes was one of the few elite groups left over, if only in part, from the old regime. So it wasn't under full frontal attack as with, say, nobilities, clergy, uh, uh, bourgeoisies, and so forth. Because intellectual laborers, as they were sometimes called in the early years, or bourgeois specialists, at least in the USSR, um, were subject to this partial accommodation with the new regime. And in terms of politics and cultural policy, a number of communists and ideologists were themselves intellectuals. Um, and while regimes, the communist regimes, aspired to create new intelligentsias, the old ones could not be replaced immediately so easily. And even more broadly, there was a kind of recurring tension between the need for expertise, the need to keep up with industrialized great power capitalist rivals, and the parties need to keep out subversive and unorthodox ideas to which intellectuals were often prone. Now, in terms of Western intellectuals looking at communism from afar, they also assumed outsized importance for communist regimes. Uh, in terms of foreign policy, and certainly in terms of the history of espionage, Western in intellectual sympathy uh, in the early decades of communism was not only an asset, but it was seen as a vehicle for influencing Western public opinion, and one that made up for, in part, uh, international isolation and other geopolitical disadvantages. Now, the contributions in this volume under the rubric of intellectuals and the utopian temptation, uh, at least those dealing with Western intellectuals, are concerned with French sympathizers with the Bolshevik Revolution and Euro-communists in France and Italy in relation to East Central Europe. The discussion of intellectuals seduced by the totalitarian temptation might be supplemented by the necessary observation in my mind that Western intellectuals also provided among the most penetrating and expert critiques of communism as well, so that not all were seduced. Anti-communism was also, to some degree, a Western intellectual construct and tradition. So you have a Janus face of intellectuals under communism, but also mirrored by the Janus face of Western intellectuals looking at communism. Um, I can't discuss in detail all the articles here, but I want to raise, at least, a certain division in approach that runs through the entire issue that might be useful in assessing ways of uncovering the history of intellectuals under communism. To simplify only a bit, the observer of this volume can discern a basic split between articles that are primarily biographical and others that are primarily contextual. That has to do, I think, with the nature of studying intellectuals under communism and intellectuals more broadly to get at the ideas, the intellectual history, the ideology the evolution of intellectuals' evil, uh, relations with the regime in question, also questions of motivation and psychology, it's often most fruitful to delve deeply into the life, lives and thoughts of key individuals, but to get at the trends, to get at the context, at cultural and scientific policy, at the place of intellectuals in the societies and in the political order, uh, at the history of scholarly fields and institutions, one has to go beyond key individuals. And so in this issue, 
perhaps the most successful example of how the two approaches go together is the pair of articles on Romanian descent. The article by Cosmina Tanasoyu about the unbearable lightness of solitude contextualizes the relative silence of dissenters under Ceausescu, but shows how even a limited few cases assume great importance. I learned a lot from this piece, but it went extremely well when paired with the in-depth discussion by Ana Maria Cantanas on the mathematician <coughs> Miha Bots, who was a leading uh, Romanian dissident. Now, many individual articles can therefore be evaluated by how well they manage the balance between the biographical intellectual development on the one hand and the political policy contextual element uh, on the other. Andrea Zamfira's article on intellectuals' enthusiasm for communism at the end of the First World War in France falls into what you might call the trap of classification, breaking down pro-communist French intellectuals into groups she calls revolutionary, nostalgic, idealist, nonconformist, and modernist. These are all useful categories, but you end up putting the individuals into those categories rather than delving so much into their evolution and the complexities of their often complicated relations with communism. Now, Bogdan Jakob's piece on co-option and control on the changing profile of the discipline of history in communist Romania is more of a hybrid of the two types of analysis I'm discussing in that he includes both key individuals and institutions and policy. It's exemplary for its careful analysis, its ability to bring out the broader dynamics of a scholarly field, in this case historiography, that was crucial at the time, but frankly few have the patience to piece together today. And I also want to single out Bogdan's piece for another feature. It plays pays close attention to the literature written about the earlier, in some ways, paradigmatic Soviet case of the 1920s and 1930s, in which there's a, a rich historiography. And here, we might observe that the two fields, East European history and Soviet history, were often you know, conflated and connected in, before 1989, perhaps too closely. But when it comes to the history of communism, of course, the two need to be connected, especially in terms of um, understanding the literature. And in a way, um, it's important for East Europeanists writing about post-45 or post-48 history to assimilate the densest historiography of Soviet, Soviet communism, which is really in the pre-war decades. And by the same token, this journal takes the opportunity to compare Romanian with other East European cases. That's an equally important endeavor. Uh, now, I'm an editor myself. Um, I edit involved with a journal here at Georgetown called Critica Explorations in Russian Eurasian History. And I'd like to point out as an editor that some of works that are designed to fit the short genre of article um, work better than others. And here, Sean Kleibel's treatment of two Czech figures, Karel Haiga and Ladislav Stroh, <coughs> is exemplary because you have the, uh, the case of the avant-gardist uh, Taiga and the Zdanovite Stoll taken often in the literature as stark opposites. But the article is determined to show the overlap between the two. Taiga was able to reconcile surrealism with communism, and Stoll was able uh, to show a degree of tactical accommodation with the avant-garde. So it takes this revision of a, of a case, delving deeply into the biographical dimension, in order to revise grand narratives about the imposition of communism in culture. So in other words, this article is able to delve into the biographical and the contextual in a short space, and then make itself relevant to bigger interpretive issues. Now I want to close <coughs> by returning uh, to the issue of Western intellectuals, who aided or expressed sympathy with, with communist regimes. If one focuses only on the intellectual seduction or blindness, one can become a little blind to certain things. For one thing, the history of the 20th century has many examples of non-intellectuals 
who also for their own reasons put aside issues of human rights and domestic communist repression. Cosmina uh, Roma Soyu reminds us that Ceausescu became a Western darling, one of Europe's good communists, to Western politicians and journalists, both because he had power and because of his foreign policy independence from the Soviets. Uh, I'll give you just one example of an earlier case which fits in with that um, from my own research. The, um, the socialist, the French socialist Edouard Herriot, the French radical party leader, three-time prime minister of France, visited starving Ukraine in August and September 1933 and reported that he witnessed no evidence of famine. And this may have been technically true since according to later Ukrainian emigres, much of the city of, of Kiev, where he was brought, was redone to simulate by the NKVD a bustling European metropolis. Diners were eating at the train station when he arrived. They pushed away full plates of food. So technically he may not have seen overt uh, evidence of famine. And Robert Conquest's treatment of Erio as a naive dupe pays great rhetorical attention to Erio's own physical corpulence. He was a very obese man in a time of famine. Timothy Snyder echoes this in his recent bloodlines. And to read these passages to become astounded and outraged by the obese Frenchman's naivete. And I don't want to deny that element. But in the case of Herriot, there is also no mention of his long history of making positive statements about the Soviet order in order to pursue diplomatic priorities. These revolved around his idée fixe to use an al Franco-Soviet alliance to counter a resurgent Germany. The enemy of his enemy was his friend, and he played a leading role in securing French diplomatic recognition for the Soviet Union in 24, and in 33, before he went to Kiev, he visited Moscow in order to pursue, somewhat less publicized, to pursue a rapprochement that led to the Franco-Soviet Pact of 1935. So, Herriot's denial of famine is a particularly egregious case, but the example that he presents of foreign policy considerations, <coughs> geopolitical or economic considerations, as opposed to intellectual sympathy and naivete purely, but those factors behind the whitewashing of human rights violations, those things are far from unfamiliar in our own time as well. So to conclude, there are plenty of lessons to be learned from the history of intellectuals and communism, but one must assess both the individual intellectuals involved and the broader context to get at them. And this volume contributes to an understanding of intellectuals under communism as encompassing both a very privileged group sometimes inside those societies, but also a very persecuted group as well. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for this really provocative and thoughtful intervention. I was thinking that indeed there's something about this particular volume and the one in Romania and what uh, since I've been reviewing this book and a few other books that have come out. Basically we we are at this moment the study of communism and of study of fascism, but primarily communism. I think I focus on communism. I think we have reached a point of uh, a point of synthesis. Where uh, and I read recently Jan Glauber's book and David Brandenburg's book and uh, Jan Berenmuller's book and so on. So if we look, at the, there's a generation between probably 35 and 41, 42 that communicate very much in front of that uh, kind of part and uh, clearly this approach, which is clearly at this moment with post Malia, uh, they accept many of, have you listened to uh, Michael David Fox, clearly many of the conclusions that are quoted Congress here and so of the totalitarian school, but take a different approach, which brings into the story the revisionist school. So we have a synthesis, and that's the way it is. So they respect of you know, the tradition of the totalitarian school, but they say there's been an archi archival revolution. Let's look into the archives and let's see what we find there. Maybe there were things which would make revisionism re revisable. Uh, yeah. And so on and so forth. Okay, so I think that we are good. I just want to say what is another very important point that where this journal is so, actually too. So there are, in as much as I know, I think I know quite a lot, is one of the very few 
channels dealing with the history of communists that's published at this moment in a former communist country. That's a very yes, there is a journal communism published by Boutois and Marc Lazar in France. I mean, there are some important journals, but in a communist country, and looking to the archives, this is I think quite unique, if I may say so, or at least pioneering, and it should be it should it should be praised. Second, it has a very important component, which is very much what Michael David Fox's book and the recent books in Soviet history do, which is bringing the international dimension back into the understanding of those societies. You know, the, the, if you look into the chapter dealing with Euro communism, which I was only blind of yours, so I know it quite well. And this is a chapter that shows that you cannot separate the dynamics of the world communist movement in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s from what was going on in the communist countries. That whatever Carrillo was doing with his Eurocommunismo Estado and all these things had an impact on some other. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity to present our work in this very prestigious mm -hmm. institution. Uh, my mission is to introduce uh, uh, the last uh, two issues of the of the yearbook in uh, Romanian of the Institute for the Investigation of Communist Crimes and the Memory of the Romanian Exile. I know it is a strange name, but it's not our fault. Uh, uh, this is uh, technically uh, a, a double issue. Uh, uh, we reunited uh, uh, two issues in one volume of uh, about uh, 500 pages because there are, let's say, three phases in the, the short history of this institution. Uh, in the, the first one, the, the, the leadership, the academic leadership of the institution focused uh, mainly on the Romanian uh, audience and uh, they targeted uh, mostly uh, Romanian readers. Um, after that, uh, it, it was a phase when, a phase when we decided that we have to, uh, let's say, to open internationally and to edit uh, 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 the, the yearbook in English we talked about. And the third phase would be to get back to the Romanian audi uh, audience because, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is one of the legal tasks we have uh, as a public institution. And uh, uh, this is uh, the first result uh, of uh, this uh, work. Uh, being an uh, institution uh, which deals with the uh, communist crimes, uh, obviously uh, the, the, the first uh, uh, theme we decided to uh, choose was uh, this very uh, generic one, but uh, uh, which was conceived to use uh, most of the work that has been done in, the, in our institution and uh, to use the experience of our um, researchers. Um, as, uh, uh, as I gained some experience in uh, coordinating and editing books, I did uh, five or four, uh, I used an, uh, an, an old formula and uh, I, I would say a successful one uh, combining the contributions of uh, reputed scholars, well-known scholars, and uh, this is uh, why we have in, in this volume Vladimir uh, Tismanian uh, or uh, Paul Hollander, with the the, uh, the work of uh, let's say the middle class of uh, Romanian uh, researchers, uh, um, people uh, of the thirties or the forties. And uh, with the contribution of some uh, very, very young uh, researchers. Some of them were formed by uh, uh, our institution or by the uh, universities. For example, we support a center for the study of uh, communism, communism and post-communism uh, at the University of Yash. And uh, 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 let's say, uh, I suppose nine of the contributions uh, out of uh, 21 are provided by uh, our former students. So we, we risk, in a way, with, uh, with including the uh, 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 contribution of, uh, of very young students, uh, 
uh, obviously they, they have some problems uh, with conceiving uh, academic texts and so on. But uh, 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 we decided to offer this opportunity and to, uh, uh, to let's say, to uh, uh, use our uh, personnel. Uh, there are uh, there are several institutions in Romania which uh, uh, deal uh, with the communist past. Uh, here is a list of them. Uh, for, unfortunately, uh, the content of the of the yearbook uh, uh, covers uh, almost uh, all of them. Some of them are governmental. Uh, some of them uh, belong to the Romanian Academy, uh, and uh, uh, we have uh, several uh, NGOs. Uh, among them, so uh, we we are uh, let's say influencing uh, and controlling some of the activity of these two institutions. Uh, uh, the other one uh, went through a, a radical change in the last uh, five years, with the uh, pretty important opening of the uh, of the archives and uh, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, uh, free access to some categories of documents which were uh, uh, previously undisclosed. And uh, uh, we have also this uh, very important institution which deals with the, uh, the, secret, the secret files of, of the Securitate. And as I said, researchers from most of these institutions uh, uh, have uh, a contribution in, uh, in our volume. <coughs> Going back to the to the uh, contribution of uh, young researchers, we we have a, 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 a small problem. Or actually, it is not small; it's uh, pretty general because uh, there is a, a, a dependency on the on the text of the communist uh, uh, documents and uh, on their statistics. Uh, uh, because some of them tend to uh, paraphrase to rephrase uh, what they uh, they find in the in the documents, and uh, uh, they are someone uh, some uh, somehow trapped in the uh, conceptual categories of the uh, of communist discourse. It's, uh, it's pretty pretty di difficult to uh, take distance uh, from the communist uh, discourse, and we have also uh, some senior historians. Uh, which depend on the conceptual apparatus of the, of the communist uh, ideology. Um, speaking about uh, the archives, um, um, it's, uh, it is important that some of the archives are, uh, are more open than, uh, let's say, five or ten years ago, and uh, uh, that's for sure the activity of the uh, Presidential Commission for the Analysis of the Communist Crimes was influential in this field because it contributed to, uh, to the opening of some of the archives. But uh, uh, some of them reversed this tendency. And I will speak about uh, the military archives, uh, which are, let's say, more closed than uh, five years ago. And paradoxically, they used the pretext of uh, getting into NATO because they use procedures for uh, uh, classified files. They apply the same uh, procedures in the case of uh, historical documents. And it, it is very difficult to see today documents uh, about the, the history of the Romanian army, which was uh, uh, also influential politically in the 40s and the 50s. So it is very difficult to see documents that other researchers uh, saw, uh, let's say, five years ago. Uh, the volume uh, has, uh, uh, of course, sections uh, dealing with uh, uh, institutions and perpetrators uh, who were involved in the uh, uh, communist repression. Uh, also, sections on the uh, um, methods of mobilization, uh, corruption, and uh, social control. And here we have uh, uh, a list of the articles and the, of the studies included in the, in the volume. Um, and uh, uh, also, uh, 
methods and uh, practices of communizing uh, uh, the culture and uh, the science. Uh, we, we, we had uh, uh, an important section uh, uh, dedicated to resistance and uh, victims, and uh, uh, a smaller section of uh, review. Uh, so, in the end, uh, I would uh, uh, encourage you to contribute if you, if you want. The next issue of the, our yearbook would be uh, dedicated to uh, Romania in the age of dictatorship. Uh, we are focusing on continuities and discontinuities between 1938 and 1989. Thank you. I'll uh, ask the Professor Dennis Delatan. I didn't mention as my point one thing. Dennis is uh, also a service chair of another uh, institute that's not been mentioned, I think, the Institute for Recent History uh, in, uh, in uh, Bucharest. And uh, as important, if not more than that, Dennis has been a mentor uh, to many of the students and researchers and historians and scientists and so on for all these years so, uh, and has uh, invested an enormous amount of enthusiasm and generosity in the design of those work, many of the researchers, so I'm extremely curious what you want to say <laughs> now about what your students have uh, covered, okay? Well, uh, as usual, uh, Vladimir, you're very generous and I, I'm extremely pleased to be here at Georgetown because as fortune would have it, uh, in February of last year, I was in London talking about volume one of the history of communism in Europe, and that, uh, for that I owe thanks to Vladimir, but also to Bob Downey. And for my presence here in Georgetown, I don't know if Jennifer's still there at the back somewhere, I owe, uh, as I say, a debt of gratitude to her. Um, indeed, it's uh, very pleasing for me to have the opportunity to speak about the contents of the volume here, Repression and Social Control in Communist Romania, um, as Adrian has pointed out, and indeed Vladimir said in his introduction, the articles are in Romania and therefore not uh, accessible perhaps to many of you here, but they are a testimony, I think, to the vibrancy um, and the initiative of the Institute, uh, which has fathered the production of the two volumes about which we're speaking this evening, and also to the guidance that uh, Vladimir and especially Bogdan has given, I think, to younger scholars, because in Romania still there is a vast generational gap between the younger generation uh, who are exploring, who are interrogating history, or who are trying to draw that distinction between the black and white of the past and looking for the grey elements in it. Uh, and the older generation of which I am a part, although I would not say I share necessarily the, the uh, objectives and the features of some of my older Romanian colleagues when they dealt with the past, especially when they did write about it in the communist period. So uh, for me, um, in a way, it's also exasperating to read these articles because I realize how much more research I need to do to keep myself up to date with the discoveries that younger scholars are making. Um, Vladimir uh, has provided with his institute since taking it over uh, a home uh, for younger scholars, but not just that, a stimulus for scholars in Romania to challenge the interdictions that still exist in some quarters uh, regarding access to documents, access to the archives. Uh, Adrian referred to the Presidential Commission on the History of Communism, of which Vladimir was the president. And the very work of the commission uh, and its activity, in fact, opened the doors for many other scholars to the archives in Romania. And I think every scholar of communism in Romania owes an enormous debt to Vladimir in that sense. Um, I was reminded when Adrian was talking about the military archives, and you'll forgive me if I reminisce a little bit, because I have a lot to reminisce about in the context of Romania, but I remember 
um, some ten years ago being asked by uh, some historians in the Pentagon here to help persuade the Romanian military archives to release some documents about 1955-56, uh, about the Warsaw Pact, Romania's membership of it, since the Pentagon had sponsored a project in Romania to publish articles. And the officer who briefed me in the Pentagon made a point of telling me that the Pentagon had donated 14 Xerox machines to the military archives in Bucharest. And when I went off to Bucharest to do a number of things, among them searching out the colonel in charge of the archives, um, I said that I'd been asked to uh, follow up on the project. Why was it that having donated 14 photocopying machines, the Romanian military archives were not producing the photocopied material that the Pentagon had requested and which the military archives had agreed to provide. And the colonel said to me that uh, he didn't know anything about these photocopying machines, that it was impossible for the archives, the military archives, to produce these documents. And so I went back and saw a general um, in the Romanian army. As I said, the head of the archives was a colonel. And I gave the general the background to the agreement, and the general stormed off up to Drumul Tabar into the military archives, and in my presence uh, chided the colonel, and the colonel's response was, ah, those 14, <laughs> those 14 <laughs> photocopying machines, I didn't know about those particular 14 <laughs> photocopying machines, and then proceeded to uh, photocopy the archives. Now, you can imagine if uh, the way to the Pentagon uh, did not manage initially to reduce a desired result as regards photocopying documents, then what hope do young Romanian scholars have? So it's, uh, again, I refer to Vladimir and Bogdan and others, it's to them that we look to put more pressure on the archives, and especially the military archives, to produce documents. Um, Adrian has given us a review of the contents of the volume here on repression and social control. Uh, I wanted to just refer to two or three of them, <coughs> two or three of them because it's impossible to comment in the time we have available on all of the articles. But um, broadly speaking, they're, di they're divided into four uh, groups. The first group of articles deals with communist repression, the second on mobilization and social control, the third on the communization of culture and the fourth on resistance and victims. And in the first category, I was particularly uh, taken by the articles on the organization of the Securitate, and also the, in, in, in particular, the Directorate for Penal Investigation, which actually is the first article in that section by Dimitri Lukatushu. Um, his article, like several of the others in that section, is based on very thorough research in the Council for the Study of the Archive of the Securitate. And it brings out those features um, of the activity of the penal directorate, um, and especially at the regional level. An article two uh, by Liviu Pleasure focuses on three of the senior officers in the Securitate and the regional directorate include uh, one of whom Colonel uh, Mihai Patricu was responsible for the arrest of many peasants who refused to be collectivized. I remember three or four years ago I came across by chance in the Council of the Securitatis Archives a document signed by Patricu uh, whereby he'd ordered the arrest of a peasant in Cluj or in the county of Cluj for not tethering his horse uh, when the team from the Securitate, a group of officers and conscripts, had come round to verify whether he was willing to sign up or not into collecting. And that even before they asked the hapless peasant whether he would sign up, um, Batricu gave the order, as I say, for his arrest because the conscripts and the officers in present had to deal with the tethering of his horse. And the hapless peasant, for that crime, Commas, spent two years on the Black Sea Canal. And that is all documented, as I say, in the artifacts. 
um, the Securitate itself in 1968, uh, as Silvio Moldovan uh, points out in his article, attempted to really parry the um, party's, uh, uh, party's efforts to uh, bring the Securitate under more party responsibility. This was at the, on the initiative of Nikolai Ceausescu, and their attempt to parry uh, this was by organizing a number of celebrations of past officers um, who'd served in the Securitate. Again, Silvio brings out, uh, I think, these activities and highlights them by looking very closely at the documents, relevant documents in the Council for the Control of Securitate documents. Silvio works there. In uh, category two, the mobilization and social control, uh, Luciana Ginga's article on representation of women in the Communist Party is, I think, highly original because very little work's been done in this regard, and she points out that despite the proactive measures taken by the party to increase the membership of women in senior positions in the party, these measures were taken between 1970 and 1980. 1980, representation of women in at the heart of the party, never at any stage uh, exceeded 36%. And this seems to me rather curious, given the role that Elena Ceausescu played in Romania at this time, and indeed the increasingly authoritarian role that she played um, in the 1980s. In Section 3, Christian Vasile's contribution on the distribution of books, on the role of literacy, uh, in the 1950s, um, again introduces new material into the uh, into this specific field. Um, he points out that the role of um, the role of the party in encouraging peasants to read uh, was very significant in persuading peasants of the merits of collectivization. His paper aims, and I think succeeds, in uh, examining and bringing um, to our attention the importance that the party played in the early 1950s in particular, the uh, importance the party placed on um, educating uh, the working class and then edu educating in particular the peasantry. Uh, finally, section four looks at the way in which the Securitate persecuted opponents of the regime. Uh, an article by Cristina uh, Roman looks at, examines the destiny of Constantin Tito Petrescu, who was head of the Social Democratic Party, the head of that part of the party which refused to join the Communist Party in 1948. Uh, Smaranda Vultur examines the typology of Securitate dossiers, she wants to uh, see how, how a certain language was developed by the Securitate in, uh, in first of all, questioning suspects, potential enemies of the regime, but also the language which the Securitate used, it uses to criminalize potential opponents and indeed actual opponents of the regime, of indeed of which indeed there were very many. And then the final two articles in that section, or final three articles, the first deals with Dimitris Stanilwai, a well-known orthodox theologian who, after spending a number of years in prison in the late 50s and early 60s, then becomes a surprising supporter of Ceausescu. Uh, one might say he is an example of the collaboration between the Romanian Orthodox Church and the Romanian regime. Um, the article by Janoshi Jonktor on Jehovah's Witnesses again opens new ground, opens new territory. Very little has been written about Jehovah's Witnesses in Romania and the um, again, persecution they endured at the hands of the regime. And then finally, there's an interesting paper on the role of the emigre Romanian community during the Second World War, and, and in particular the group led by Viorel Tilia. What uh, Delia Cornia 
the author of that article doesn't say, and she has no means of knowing, uh, because she's using uh, solely the archive of the um, Securitate, is that in the British archives, the British authorities at the time were extremely exasperated by the infighting that went on between the various Romanian immigrant groups, and indeed they washed their hands of all of them after a couple of years, which is one reason why the immigrants in London did not play a major role in um, opposition to the Antonesca regime in the, in the period 1940-44, uh, partly because the British had no faith in the opposition. Well, uh, I'll leave it to Vladimir to round up uh, the Thank you. Thank you very yeah. very much for this. Informative and enthusiastic, and the very nice words you, uh, you, you, you said about. And I think that there are a few things that I would like to emphasize before we proceed with questions and answers and comments. First, we had a presentation of different institutions, and I think it's uh, it's only fair to mention that between 2006 and 2000, sorry, December 2005 and March 2000. Then mm -hmm. uh, the institute uh, existed and then this is for the investigation of crisis of communism uh, run by uh, a uh, well uh, recognized uh, historian, especially in the field of the cadres and the security Mario Sopra. Uh, the, uh, in the same vein, the institute for the, the memory of the exile existed again until whatever the merger took place. And it was run by a well-known uh, emigre, former emigre, a liberal politician. Uh, it was so I think it's fair to mention these things. It's also fair to mention that we have, uh, I was asked, and I do it here, to convey uh, best regards to the leadership of the Institute, uh, Professor Ivan Stanomir and Dr. Christian Vasile, who are not here, but they know, of course, about the event. It's been put on the site of this. Now, when uh, Professor Delatant mentioned uh, here the situation of the, the, uh, the famous theologian uh, Stanley Lai and other cases, there are many of uh, distinguished faces of the Romanian Orthodox Church and not only the Romanian Orthodox Church. All the religious denominations were deeply penetrated, to put it nicely and mildly. Okay, I don't think, however, that, you know, I, I'm not a student of this part. Christy Vasile is uh, a student of this particular area, and there are other people. Uh, but he has written. But I was looking to this piece in today's New York Times. In Bulgaria, the two things interesting about Bulgaria. In Bulgaria, the newly elected president promised to remove ambassadors and diplomats who worked with the communist state security apparatus. Even as it was recently revealed now, that was probably the half of the uh, diplomatic war in Bulgaria, and probably I don't want to comment in Romania. Okay, <laughs> because I told her that would be an earthquake. <laughs> no, bureaucratic earthquake, if they were to go into this direction. Okay, I don't know if anybody has this initiative these days. But the second thing I speak as a professor at Maryland and not as the president of the institute, whatever. Okay, uh, but in Bulgaria, uh, the recently, it, recently it was revealed that 11 out of country's 15 highest ranking bishops were secret police agents. Okay, uh, I was told that out of these 11, five were officers in the secret police, not simply agents. They had the rank of, I don't know, major or general or whatever. Also in Russia, it appears that they were, yes, they, they, they ranked, they had ranked in the secret police. Now, this is really a figure of the, the, you know, God and Mamona are working hand in hand. It, you know, it's quite uh, it's hard to understand, but it was like it. So, the floor, as I said, is open for uh, questions, comments, uh, and uh, anything that can add uh, to the discussion. If we can go on and on. So, Please. I'm trying to think. There was comment I know in East Germany right. about Margot Honecker and the suspicious nature of her thesis, her doctoral degree. Wasn't there something about that, about Mrs. Chalchescu, too? Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> uh, there is a consensus. Recently, a book came out uh, of conversation with former foreign minister Stefan Andre was a top diplomat of the Church of Square, who is now 80. Mm -hmm. uh, and the book came out, came out one or two months ago, okay, uh, 
Uh, Stefan Andre refers to two persons, two well-known women in the party apparatus. A uh, party old timer, of course, for many years the head of the international department of the party, which was sent off to the uh, and Elena Ceausescu. He said that he never saw either Gisela or Elena Ceausescu writing anything but their signatures. That's what he says. Uh, if I take this as a hint to her intellectual creativity, uh, it is highly possible that somebody else was wrote the dissertation, and we have enough information that it was probably academician Christopher Simeonescu who was one of the authors. So the Ceausescu also write these immense volumes, I remember in the 70s. They are we were there and they were over oh, no, you have a huge collective of people of course no. but Ceausescu if you see the film uh, the autobiography of Nikolai Ceausescu you will see in the film that basically his vocabulary there are people that have done studies about the uh, total number of words in Ceausescu's real vocabulary was probably no more than uh, they say that dogs recognize 200 words uh, Ceausescu had 500 okay that active words uh, no, I like dogs. I mean, do not, please. I'm not Zomorg. I'm not in this. Okay. <laughs> so, but basically, his vocabulary was probably twice and a half larger than the vocabulary of a smart dog. Okay, so, uh, um, if I may, Vladimir, I can add <laughs> something to that because at the time of uh, Ceausescu's state visit to Great Britain in the summer of 1978, um, Christopher Simeonescu came to the Royal Academy in, uh, in London seeking the um, approval, or seeking to persuade the president of the Royal Academy to give Madame Ceausescu honorary membership of the Royal Academy. And it so happened that my wife was translating for the president of the Royal Academy. So that's how I know this story. And the president asked Professor Simeonescu, come on now, be honest with me. Does Madame Ceausescu really deserve to be an honorary member of the Royal Academy? Did she write her thesis? And Professor Simeonescu turned to my wife and said, for God's sake, don't tell anyone what I'm going to reply to the president. And he replied, no, she didn't write her thesis. I wrote it. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, this, yeah, so... There were a number of instances where the authorities at the time tried to persuade various British academic institutions to confer honorary degrees on Alan Chantrescu. Um, apart from the Polytechnic of Central London, which made her an honorary professor, um, they all refused. Please. I think it's noteworthy that among uh, former Soviet communist countries, only I think in the Czech Republic the illustration has been undertaken successfully. And I think in Poland there was some degree of uh, uh, purges of the former communist officials. But, but in most uh, communist countries, really what we see, you mentioned in the news today, most, the, in, in, in the discipline of history there's always a question of continuity and discontinuity. And what we see about the collapse of the communist regime communism, uh, uh, the Soviet communism, is that there isn't a lot of discontinuity in, 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 in terms of this political transformation, political change. A lot of people who were in power, I'm from Azerbaijan, a from Azerbaijan, and, and Azerbaijan, the, the, this is son of the guy who was a KGB general and a Politburo member, is still there, and many of the people who were members of the Central Committee are still in power. And I think this goes to the question of political elite. It seems like in the absence of foreign occupation, it's very difficult to carry out this illustration. And this also speaks to the question of intellectual. Uh, Dr. Fox mentioned the outsized influence of the intellectuals when it comes to the, to the issue of communism, uh, which is particularly ironic considering Vladimir Lenin's own attitude about, toward intellectuals. Uh, well, I'll just say one word about that because Lenin, yes, hated the intellectuals, and he said a lot of nasty comments, and also sent telegrams during the Civil War, saying, we need to shoot some more intellectuals, <laughs> because that was a kind of exemplary, you know, uh, violence. However, 
he was himself a member of the radical intelligentsia. And so there's a kind of self-hating of the intellectuals, of other of intellectuals that is at play there, I think. And, you know, clearly, to jump many decades forward, the person who wrote Ceausescu's wife's dissertation was in some sense an intellectual, a scholar. And so, you know, it really points to a certain, um, yes, Lenin and the early Bolsheviks developed, a and I think this is true for many communist regimes where they emphasize the proletarian element, at least in the early years especially, are developing a kind of anti-intellectual, anti-intelligentsia uh, discourse and policies at the same time that they are creating a new intelligentsia, that they are in many ways coming to a give that intelligentsia a very privileged role in the new system. Now, Oscar, Oskarov is pointing out also um, the, the very crucial relationship between elites and the functioning of the entire system. And I think if you're looking at the end of the Soviet movie, the Soviet collapse, Stephen Kotkin, for example, has written a lot about the continuities before and after 91. But one thing he really shows is that there is a kind of generational, of, um, there's a real generation, generational turnover in that mid-level and low-level cadres are really coming to the fore after privatization. And so it's possible to exaggerate the continuities as well, but clearly we can't see it as this kind of you know, complete break with the past. And it just shows that you can really, um, depending on how you define intellectuals and intelligentsia, if you want to talk more broadly about elites, the functioning of the system and you know, all these disciplines that were so closely connected to party ideology could not have been facilitated without a very large role played by these, um, these elites. One phrase, speaking about continuities, Christopher Simeonescu was the uh, president of the Yash branch of the Romania Academy for 15 years after the revolution, after uh, 1989. So he was uh, my boss because I work in an in institute of the Romania Academy for at least seven years. Uh, you want to say something about the, what happened in Romania was the conversion of the elites and uh, well, yeah, non okay. maybe a few words about this particular case in Romania. Uh, normally there are uh, two classic ways of, uh, of making the transition of justice. Uh, one by some uh, panel trials, if you want, but, or establishing tribunals to, 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 to judge uh, the perpetrators of the communist crimes. Well, the other one is the, what uh, Professor Tosmanano actually did much later in 2006 uh, by establishing the so-called Truth Commission in a way. And uh, Romania uh, had uh, both, uh, both these means uh, at its disposal, but the thing uh, with uh, the trials is the following. At the beginning of the, uh, the 90s, there were a set of uh, trials against uh, more against militaries and what happened during the events in 1999. And, uh, with the trial of uh, the Ceausescu's couple, which was actually a masquerade in terms of the judicial medium, if you want. Uh, uh, the, the overall talk about uh, uh, the communist period was closed, just like that, by condemning the couple to death. And all the other trials that followed this, uh, this uh, main trial were just uh, an euphemism to, to say that some people are uh, to be, to be Pointed guilty for what happened in 1999, but not uh, for what happened before 1999. And uh, some would say that uh, uh, Professor Tisnanus' commission came in a way too late, but more uh, would say uh, it was necessary. And I think uh, we should forget uh, uh, Idiescu's regime and Constantinescu's regime and what they did fail to, to, to accomplish in terms of transitional justice. But it is important that starting with uh, December 2006 when the president condemned publicly condemned communism in, in the parliament, uh, many, many, many doors and ways are, are still opened. And uh, uh, my, my, my personal conviction is that uh, the edu educational projects are, are, are 
so so important. And the Institute, uh, in this regard, uh, has published uh, uh, a handbook, uh, an alternative uh, history of the Armenian communism, which is actually taught in uh, many many high schools in Romania. I think that's very important. And besides that, uh, we are hosting the trainings with history professors, uh, like uh, Theodore Adorno would say, it is highly important to educate or re-educate the educators in order to have uh, future generations prepared to grasp and acknowledge what happened before making And many, many other uh, interactive portals or electronic uh, app and I think uh, it's, it's highly important to, 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 to link these efforts and in, in endeavors uh, with, uh, with uh, state policies. This is what the Institute is doing right now. Uh, maybe it's too late for, to talk some more about illustration or other panel complaints, because actually we try to, to formulate this complaint against the former representatives of the penitentiary system, but nothing happened. I mean, our task is to gather material and information about these perpetrators and uh, uh, pass, this, uh, pass uh, these packages on to to the one who are entitled to take measures, but somehow there is this continuity uh, at many different levels, and this stumbles our efforts day by day, but in the end, uh, you cannot allow this to, 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 to stop the decriminalization process. Then, if you want to say a few words about, okay, so. Uh, so, I, so one more thing in regard to this, because <laughs> um, talked about this initiative as you know this combi combines the work of Western scholars and scholars in Romania combines the work of work on Romania and other East European countries and taking into account the literature of the Soviet Union. But if you're talking into uh, taking into account the question of continuities before and after the communist collapse. You have to develop another kind of bridge crossing, and that is between the disciplines of social sciences, which are often devoted to studying the present, and those who study the communist past, the, mainly historians. And th those bridges are not that common. I mean, Vladimir Tisvignan is a, uh, a political scientist who read history, but there are not so many uh, historians who also work on contemporary events, and there are a lot fewer social scientists looking at uh, historical issues than there might be. So perhaps that's another area to overcome this uh, divide. I was thinking, thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, yeah. Okay, the, what I'm, let me say, first of all, uh, there is the line, uh, you may remind me, it's the line from Faulkner, the past is not finished, the past is not the past, it's not even the past, it's not even the past. Okay, so first of all, the idea, which is, uh, so it's not by God, it's here, somewhere. So the idea of wishing away the past, which maybe many people think, like for instance the Greek theme after 1974, when democracy was restored in Greece, just probably most people know the Okay or no about that, but the solution, the Greek solution, was the solution of time, the solution of burning the archives of the city of Asphalt, just get rid of them. Okay, that's one solution, so we can go into many solutions. Uh, uh, the, would these things uh, go far away? The whole argument in today's paper is that uh, historical proximity is not necessarily a condition for doing that, but rather the more distant from the particular moment, the chances for, let's call it a, uh, a uh, coming to terms with the past, or what the Germans called Vergangenheitsbefeldigung, would take place somehow. If the French, we had the conference what, uh, that Ceres was part of the sponsorship of the conference, we had it in, 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 if you are not at that one. Last year, or whenever it was, the one on uh, coming to terms with the past. 2010. 2010. And uh, as a matter of fact, we had somebody there who spoke. 
a well-known French historian, one of the most respected French historians, Annette Vivolta. And Annette Vivolta started her presentation with the 1995 condemnation of the Vichy regime only by President Jacques Chirac. Between 1945, so you had De Gaulle, you had La Quatrième République, you had the beginning of La Cinquième, you had De Gaulle, Pompidou, Giscard d'Estaing, Mitterrand, etc. It's only in 1995 a French president came and apologized in the name of the French Republic and said the crimes of Vichy are crimes of the French state. The myth in between four decades was that Vichy did not represent the French state. This, you know, that was some aberration that took place, God knows what. Okay. But the French state. So this is why I think the symbolic, the symbolism of 2006, the pity that that was later. It's I don't care about triumphs or non triumphs, but even if I don't care who would have delivered that speech and so on, it was a speech delivered in the name of the Romanian state. And that's the interaction that you are looking for. Now, illustration. I want to say that as we talk right now, there is a man in Bucharest and three of his colleagues who are on hunger strike. Uh, he is the president of December 21st Association in Romania. And what is December 1st, 21st? It's the day, basically, when people took to the streets, good churches from the beginning of the revolution in Bucharest. Okay? This is the day of the revolution. Okay? This man was in the demonstration. And so on. His name is Theodor Maria. He asks for three major. He's the today is the 92nd day of his hunger strike. If that continues to die, and then you'll have it in the you know, so on. He's asking clearly for three things: illustration law. The illustration law was voted by the Romanian Parliament, by the way, last year. Voted, and it went to the Constitutional Court and rejected by the Constitutional Court. Uh, probably those who voted for it knew that would happen, so they didn't have particular problems because they already expected the Constitutional Court, which is made up, speaking of, at least half of the Constitutional Court are members, ex-members of the you know, judicial nomenclature of the communist era. So they found the classical arguments against administration, collective punishment, and so on and so forth, and, uh, although it's a very mild law uh, compared to the Czech law. Okay. They finally purged it, even the former professors of the party academy. I mean, if there was one institution whose area of expertise was to turn people into imbeciles, were the party academy. I mean, that was basically the institution, state organized cretinization or moralization. I mean, that was exactly what moral moralization and intellectual moralization. Okay? So, okay, these people will not be purged, although they were paid to be professors of imbecility. Okay, that was exactly what they were doing. What they're doing in Germany, you have a second case, uh, Germany, the so Czech Republic and Germany. Okay, that was very strong restriction laws. I mean, things were very tough in Germany, and they are still very tough. In Germany. I mean, but today, they you have quoted Mr. Gysi here said, "Oh, this is segregation, discrimination, and so on." So, but Mr. Gysi is a former civil policy reformer, my other things. So he should keep it a little bit more about it. So, the second law that Doro Maria and his group are asking for, uh, by the way, the Institute, we support the law of Australia, we support all the three laws. Two came from us. Okay, we proposed them and then passed to the Parliament. The second law is the, you'd say it's simple, because it's international law. International law prevails over national law. It's the law of the imprescriptibility, so no statute of limitation for crimes against humanity, what Mr. Uh, the Judge Garçon used against Pinochet regardless of his current uh, how I call them, uh, travails, whatever, for Judge Garçon, <laughs> at that moment, that was what we used, okay? The international law that means crimes against humanity cannot be prescribed. Period. They last forever until you bring the person for... Okay, that's the second law. I don't understand why it's so difficult for the Romanian parliament to go to, but they don't. I can say, because Mr. Iliescu, would be involved in some of this problem. So therefore, the Social Democratic Party, which is the largest party of the opposition, has no interest in passing this law. Okay, I have an ask. In the third law, what is the third law? Uh, it's the, oh, uh, recognition uh, or gratitude. It's the law of gratitude for those people that mentioned, the dissidents and the revolutionaries and so on. 
Uh, the argument is, of course, it's crisis. It's always a crisis. It's always a recession. It's always a problem. There will always be a problem. So, you know, but I think his depression also is a Dominican Republic. I don't think the Dominican Republic is doing so well. And I read in the New York Times two months ago that $3 million were given by the Dominican Republic government to establish a museum of the crisis of the Trujillo. I wrote on my blog, I wrote on that, and nobody cared. I mean, you know, what can we do? We can't you know, we complain. Okay, so these are the laws. None of them would ruin the Romanian state, let's face it. Somebody ironical sent me the same parliament that has no time to discuss these three laws. Today passed, approved the law on uh, organizing picnics. I'm not kidding. Okay, so they were very interested in the problem of how you organize your weekends and so on. But this is, I don't know if it's a joke or not, but I hope it is. Because indeed, 